to talk about the redesign of healthcare in a COVID and post-COVID environment, please welcome Dr. Redonda Miller, President of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Good morning. My name is Redonda Miller. I'm the president of the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, and it is a pleasure to speak to you today, albeit taped from a couple of weeks ago. You know, I would like to first start out by just saying thank you. Thank you to the leaders. You guys are leaders of your respective hospitals and health systems. And I know this past year has been incredibly challenging. Thank you on behalf of patients for seeing us through this pandemic. Hopefully an end will be in sight. And then even more importantly, taking lessons we've all learned and moving them into providing better health care in the future. Thought I would start by just giving you a little bit of background about the hospital and health system here at Hopkins. The Johns Hopkins Hospital was founded in 1889, sort of a first of its kind care model whereby teaching and research would be done at the bedside. There was a stress on not only innovation and discovery, but also on local community care. Fast forward to 2020, and we are now a pretty sprawling health system that we call Johns Hopkins Medicine, partnership of our health system and university. You can see it in the hospital on the lower left. We are about 1,000 beds. We are about 2.7 billion in revenue and have several important designations. As a health system and the greater Johns Hopkins Medicine, we now have built ourselves to six hospitals, both academic and community, and several other business lines, including home health care, a payer arm, a primary care network, and of course, Johns Hopkins Medicine International. We are around 8.5 billion in revenue, and our mission spreads not only up and down the Mid-Atlantic, but across the nation and across the globe. You know, normally in a talk on the COVID pandemic, we often start with an analogy to the 1918 flu pandemic that took the world by storm and cost us 50 million in lives. I'd like to start at a little different place. I wanna take you to event 201. This occurred on October 18th of 2019 at the Pierre Hotel in New York City. This was a simulation exercise involving 15 high-level policymakers, business leaders, uh, and other officials that was held in an effort to prepare us better for the next pandemic. It was hosted by the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Economic For Forum. And I will say the, uh, the key person there was Dr. Tom Inglesby, who I will give a personal shout out to. Tom and I were chief residents together many decades ago at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. But imagine this is the scenario that was put forward at that event. A quick spreading novel coronavirus had its beginnings on a pig farm in South America. It quickly spread to the local largest city and then by plane across the country and across the world. There was no cure and a vaccine was at least a year off. It was an incredibly quick transmission. Many people were infected. There was economic collapse, social media disinformation. And when it was all said and done 18 months later, over 65 million dead. Live to live minute broadcasts were put out by GNN, their form of a global news network. And there we have it. The outtake of this simulation exercise were several recommendations that would help prepare us for the next pandemic. What is most eerie about this event 201 is this happened just one to two months before our true novel coronavirus hit the world and with so many similarities as you will see on this slide. So in reality, we have not had time to prepare. And honestly, here's a quote that I, I share with you from the event. I don't think prepared is a place. I think we can only be better prepared. And hopefully, even though we didn't have time to fully enact those recommendations from Event 201, we are learning on the fly. And I'm hopeful that uh, some of the lessons I've personally learned here at Hopkins will serve us well for the next pandemic, as there will be one. So I'm gonna start and go through with you just a few key lessons I've learned. Uh, number one, preparation helps, but you're never going to fully be there. Two, your hospital response should be data-driven with quick decision-making and a willingness to pivot as new information becomes available. 
And finally, communication and transparency are key to maintaining trust and quality of care for our patients. So let me talk just a little bit about our response. I'll be honest, we thought we were fairly well prepared. We had a biocontainment unit. Now, those of you, many of you remember the Ebola outbreak of 2014. Um, and we stood up uh, as a response to that, a biocontainment unit, an Ebola and other special pathogens treatment center. Across the US, there was a plan to put 10 of these regional centers in place that would better prepare us. We were uh, lucky enough to apply and be accepted and have built what I think is a remarkable unit. It has contained rooms, lab, surgery suite, um, an autoclave for waste disposal, air handling, everything you can imagine to be prepared. And perhaps the most valuable aspect is this multidisciplinary team that has been in continuous training mode since 2015, learning how to don and doff PPE, how to take precautions, follow protocols. And you can see some of the outcomes, over 400 trained, an education program, not just internally, but one we've spread to other areas for special pathogen treatment centers, and just a lot of research that's come out of this. So we could argue, okay, we had a biocontainment unit. We are also very proud of our capacity command center. Uh, here's a picture of it. You can see it has this NASA-like quality with all of the key personnel sitting around sharing a common data platform uh, visually displayed on multiple monitors. This command center allowed us to really leverage our capacity, manage beds across the system, uh, help with transfers, transportation, emitting services, and the like. We opened it in 2016, and it was a strong partnership with GE Healthcare who helped us decide, design and launch it. We started with the wall of analytics that you saw, bringing in data from multiple sources, a real-time bed management system, and now we've taken it to the next level with predictive modeling, allowing us to not only react, but proactively determine what beds we might need. And you can see some of the outcomes of our Capacity Command Center. Improvements in OR transfer delays, 60% um, ability improvement in our ability to accept complex patients from elsewhere, 30% reduction in bed assignment time. I mean, basically, we've been able to create 16 additional beds with no additional physical investment. So we're very proud of this Capacity Command Center. Nonetheless, coronavirus, COVID-19 hit and we still found that we had so much to learn. So I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of slides highlighting various aspects of our response to show you sort of how we responded. I bet you had similar, a similar experience or perhaps different based on your own regional locale. We had the good fortune here at Johns Hopkins of learning from colleagues who went before us, certainly many of you in China, but also in the States, in Seattle, in New York, and through personal outreach obtained very good guidance. We also developed a coronavirus resource center. This was an incredible collaboration between different parts of the university. Dr. Lauren Gardner is the name you often hear associated with it. And she was able to start with first that famous map that allowed you to see in real time where cases were occurring but it evolved into much more. A resource center that had educational materials, content that was continually updated, and resulted in over a billion views worldwide. We also leveraged data and information internally. We developed multiple dashboards, and you can see some of them here. Some of these indicators were available right in our electronic medical record. We happened to use the EPIC system. So anyone could log on and understand how many patients we had with COVID-19. Were they on a ventilator? Um, what did we see coming from other hospitals? And it was just so helpful that everyone was reacting to the same data. And then finally, we put a lot of emphasis on modeling. And we would have, and continue to this day, have weekly sessions with epidemiologists to sort of try to predict what the next wave will look like using, and believe me, this is hard work because there are so many variables that go into predictive modeling. But we certainly do our best and it allows us to try to proactively plan our next set of beds. We also learned a lot about creating physical capacity. 
we're lucky enough at the Johns Hopkins Hospital to have two new towers that we were able to convert floor by floor to negative pressure. And we all know negative pressure is so key into keeping patients and staff safe. So we made a system decision that we would take the most critically ill patients from across our five hospitals in the Mid-Atlantic and bring them to the Johns Hopkins Hospital for care. That means we had to find capacity instantly. We canceled elective and non-emergent surgeries right away. We maximized our physical facilities, as I mentioned, and kudos to our physical facilities team that were able to flip these units and build donning and doffing anterooms literally overnight. Um, we used predictive modeling to try to figure out how many units we would need, not just tomorrow, but next week and the following week. And all told, we, uh, at the peak of our, our surge in April, we're up to running six ICUs for COVID patients, one immediate care unit, and floor, four acute care floors. Staffing. This has to be one of our most difficult challenges. You know, and I'm sure you all have experienced it as well. We had a nursing shortage even before COVID-19 hit. And then on top of it, to try to find the right personnel to care for patients as these MICU type patients expanded exponentially. So we obviously worked on redeployment. Our OR nurses, our ambulatory surgery nurses, staff at all levels of the organization, we redeployed, which we needed, we needed quick on the ground training. Some of our staff were incredibly specialized. You can imagine when you're doing complex surgeries and your skill set is managing drains from a Whipple procedure, you have to go back and learn how to handle an IMC or, or a critical care patient. So we did training upskilling for over 300 res, uh, nurses on the fly. We also enacted a pod model whereby we could leverage our critical care expertise and take that ICU nurse to supervise four to five uh, acute care nurses and care for those ICU patients. And that was really instrumental for us. We developed a supplemental staffing pool. We've hired 14 COVID providers, hospitalists, intensivists, focused solely on the care of COVID patients. And we were lucky enough, some of our own fellows wanted to take a year off to do this work. We've developed new roles, patient safety officers. These are staff members who can watch our other staff, Don and Dolph, to make sure they are doing it correctly. Because we all know how important that step is so that we do not um, unintentionally infect, cause nosocomial transmission. We also developed prone teams. We saw early on that in some of these ICUs we stood up, they were not used to flipping a patient from the supine to the prone position. And a prone position allows better ventilation for your intubated patients. So with all these tubes and wires hooked up, mistakes can be made during that patient flip. So we developed a prone team to descend to the unit and help uh, oversee this transition in our patient position. And that led to a lot of safety. And then I don't need to say much about contact tracing. You all live and breathe this. We developed our internal contact tracing mechanisms so we could quickly isolate any staff member who may have been infected and prevent further spread in our hospital walls. Building a testing infrastructure, I'd like to say a few words about this because initially in the US, testing was a very scarce commodity. Luckily, a couple of our microbiologists had the foresight before the first case even hit the US to put in an application to develop our own in-house COVID test. And I can tell you this was so key to our initial response. While some of our labs, uh, some of our colleagues at other hospitals were taking eight, nine, 10, 12 days to turn around a COVID test, this in-house capability allowed us to flip a result in eight hours. Now, of course, since then, testing has expanded, but reagents continue to be in short supply. So our lab has now 11 different testing platforms to try to minimize and diversify that reagent supply. We also found that many of our patients were coming from vulnerable populations, coming through our EDs, coming from other hospitals, and those facilities were not equipped to deal with the pandemic. Think nursing homes. Uh, that's the first one that comes to mind. You are not equipped as a nursing home to deal with this. 
So we at Johns Hopkins developed a GO team. This would be a team of physician, nurses, emergency personnel, lab personnel who could descend to the nursing home and help provide in-house testing on site, isolate residents who were infected, and prevent future spread. We did the same thing for homeless shelters. And then we've also focused on accessibility of testing in the community, developing drive-through stations where patients could just drive through and not get out of the car, uh, community-based. And of course, when you think about vulnerable populations, we had zip codes around the hospital of underserved patients. Uh, some were immig had immigrant status, but for whatever reason, we needed to bring testing to them. So we sent teams to the community, often to a local church, to help do on-site testing so patients, future patients could get the care they needed. Obviously, we had to develop an asymptomatic test response for patients being admitted or undergoing surgery. Right now, we're up to about 3,000 tests per day we can do right here on site. We hope to add another 4,000 tests per day in January that may help manage our undergraduates, uh, and that's our current state here. But this took a lot of work to develop this infrastructure. A little bit about communication and transparency. I personally believe this was incredibly key to our response. We had staff that were scared. They had never been in a situation like this. They were worried not only could they get COVID-19 and bring it home to their families, they also had children who had virtual school and trying to manage and balance work with homeschooling kids. They had financial issues, perhaps a spouse had lost a job. The stress on our staff was really um, almost to the point of breaking. So we had to, we knew that communication and transparency would be key. If you, um, if you understand where the institution is going and what lies before you, it brings such peace of mind and you're better able to cope. So we stood up an incident command structure whereby we had a system-wide incident command that would be available 24-7, staff 24-7, with all the different departments you could imagine. Uh, communications, PPE and supplies, testing, hospital operations, and so forth. Under the system incident command, we had each entity, so each hospital had a command structure, and then in the departments, they also had a command structure. So communication could flow up and down the organization seamlessly. Here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, we also developed our own leadership huddles twice a day, 11 and 5, every single day, Monday through Sunday, uh, in order to make decisions quickly and really react to fresh incoming data. We also worked on mass communication, broad communication. We have 11,000 employees here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, 45,000 across the system, 4,500 credentialed medical staff and trainees. It's hard to communicate with that large group. So we developed manager forums for our 700 managers. We sent out mass emails, uh, newsletters, and really tried to communicate as best we could. So here we are. Um, remember, I'm gonna remind you that I'm taping this on November 23rd. So I'm giving you the state of the US at this point in time. I will hold on to hope that by the time I'm reaching you on December 8th, that things have improved. But in the US, uh, our November 21st data shows that we are now on average around 180,000 new cases a day. This is not good. We have 83,000 hospitalized, 256,000 deaths. You can see here in this graph sort of the waves. That first initial bump was what we saw in our large cities, Seattle, New York. Then you see the second wave over the summer where um, some of our social distancing was relaxed a bit and we had a blur, uh, a blip up and down the coast. Now on uh, the far right of this graph, you will see where we are today. It is widespread throughout the US, even our rural states in the Midwest, North and South Dakota, Montana, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan are all being hit hard with coronavirus. We continue to not know at this point in time the timing or the height of that peak, um, what the case severity will bring. We have a lot of new treatments, so we have hope that perhaps we can help treat people more effectively. We don't have a good sense of what the holidays will bring for us, Thanksgiving, some of the winter holidays like Hanukkah, Christmas and such. 
And we don't know future government actions or the availability of a vaccine. We're hopeful with the recent news of four new vaccines, but you know, getting those dispersed uh, and allocated and administered uh, is the work that remains before us. I want to transition just quickly, if you will indulge me, on where do we go from here? We, uh, we're going to be living in a post-COVID world at some point. And how can we take some of these lessons we've learned in the COVID pandemic and transition them into some of the trends we had already started to see in the redesign of healthcare for the future? So I'd like to cover five points on what I see as trends to pay attention to going forward. Number one, precision medicine will better inform our care. Two, technology is going to provide much greater flexibility for our care. Three, care will shift from being hospital-centered to more community-based. Four, systems, healthcare systems, will leverage the value of centralization. And finally, partnerships will continue to drive greater health impact than any institution can do alone. So I'm just gonna walk through a little bit of these, if you will indulge me, starting with precision medicine. I really believe precision medicine has launched to a great degree prior to COVID and will just continue that trajectory. Think about oncology care. We now can target genetic mutations and apply the exact right therapy to the exact right patient with cancer. Breast cancer is no longer a homogenous disease. It is very individual specific. Precision medicine uses that data, that measurement, that connectivity among members of subgroups to really customize medicine, customize medicine to the individual to drive better outcomes. At Hopkins, we have our in-health initiative, uh, and there are multifacets to this precision medicine initiative. We've developed a precision medicine analytics platform that pulls data from multiple sources, claims data, electronic medical records data, et cetera, to really put it together to drive solutions. We have a biobank we're launching. We have centers of excellence that are disease focused. For instance, multiple sclerosis or COPD or prostate cancer. And out of the COVID crisis, we've had the birth of a center of excellence around Corona COVID-19. One of the uh, works that emerged from COVID we're very proud of is our J-Crown registry. This registry harnessed data from hundreds of COVID patients across the system and work recently published by Dr. Garibaldi and his colleagues in the Annals of Internal Medicine put forward a prediction model that takes these data and allows you to predict based on risk factors and disease characteristics, which patients can go to another level of care, which may need ICU level of care. It allows you to really manage your capacity proactively and also set family expectations. So that has been invaluable. I think we're gonna see more and more of these kinds of precision health tools. Technology and flexibility. Wow, we have ramped up our remote monitoring capabilities so much during the COVID pandemic. We always knew EICUs were very popular, but we've been able to take this notion of um, ICU monitoring remotely to a whole new level and added in parameters like monitoring actual waveforms, which has been difficult to do before now. And why this is important is you can imagine the fewer trips you have to make into a patient room to read a ventilator screen, the, the better it is for nosocomial transmission, the better it is to conserve PPE. Um, but harnessing this data also allows you to do some of the other bullets I've mentioned here, predictive analytics, um, quality improvement. Did we make the right moves on this patient, the right care uh, management strategies based on the data at the time? And so you can continue to be a learning organization. We've really launched Telesitter to a wide degree. As personnel are in very scarce supply, we no longer can uh, have the luxury of having someone at the bedside. Think about the delirious patient. Think about the patient that needs constant 24 seven watch. Now through cameras and technology and, and remote alarms, we can, har we can harness people sitting in other rooms off site to keep that visual eye on the patient. Robotic systems. During the COVID pandemic, 
we developed here at Hopkins a robot that could go into the room and change the ventilator settings. Once again, anytime you can minimize going in and out of a room for staff safety, for patient safety, for PPE preservation is a good thing. We're piloting drones that can take precious supplies across campuses and share resources. Uh, we test piloted a drone in the Arizona desert that was able to go over 160 miles carrying blood and doing it safely at the right temperature. So this is really going to uh, think about traffic on the ground, minimize all of that commotion and be able to deliver by drone. And then other technologies I won't go into here, but you all know uh, smart watches, Fitbits. There was a study published recently where people could actually predict who had COVID by monitoring heart rate, respiratory rate, and such before the patient, him, him or herself, even knew it. So we're gonna continue to hear more about wearables um, and more about um, video games for rehab. There's been a lot of work on uh, occupational health and, and uh, fine tuning your motor skills based on playing video games. Technology is the watchword of the future. I'll say a few bit, a few uh, uh, pieces of uh, pearls, I would say, about care shifting from being hospital-centric to community-based. I do think this trend started pre-COVID, and now we're seeing it more and more. People don't necessarily want to drive 20 miles to an academic medical center, fight for parking, and you know we're often big and sprawling. People want care where they are. That is what patients want. So we as healthcare systems need to drive that. We're seeing ambulatory surgery centers crop up, freestanding medical facilities, community sites, and so forth. In that same vein, telemedicine, I would argue, is here to stay. I will tell you at Johns Hopkins, we went from about 70 virtual visits per month pre-COVID to over 90,000 at the peak of our crisis in May. I'm talking 70 to 90,000. What had been a five-year strategic plan, we had to launch in five days. And I, I'm surprised patients love it. I'm an internist, I still see patients, even patients I have who are in their 90s and I thought would never be able to embrace this technology, pop up, zoom in, have a visit with me virtually, and the satisfaction is sky high, 95%. So I do think telemedicine is here to stay. We will find the right balance, the right equilibrium, because not all care can be delivered remotely. We still need to be able to do a physical exam, listen to the lungs and so forth. So we will find that balance. And of course, there are always provider reimbursement issues. You know, where will we land with payer reimbursement? Probably more relevant to us here in the States. I will also mention hospital at home. You know, we uh, this was a concept that was developed here at Hopkins over a decade ago and piloted in a national study and has found to be incredibly successful. As beds are incredibly scarce during the COVID pandemic, you can see immediately the virtue of the hospital at home, taking care to the patient. And patients, patients not only like it, you order fewer tests, the quality of care is the same, and you're able to decrease the costs of providing that care by 30%. So I look forward to seeing how this plays out in our future. Just a couple more slides. I wanna talk about centralization, leveraging centralization across a healthcare system. We had to do this, you know, we always had designs that we would work more in a more integrated fashion. COVID-19 ramped this up on steroids. We quickly saw that it was um, duplicative and inefficient to develop isolated policies at each of our six different hospitals. So we did those centrally, things like our visitor policy, our PPE policy, elective surgeries, and so forth. We will continue to see this because it just, you should have the same experience no matter which Johns Hopkins Medicine Hospital you enter. We saw that patient placement was incredibly improved by working together as a system, by showing um, all of the bed availability in some of those dashboards you saw, we were able to manage our beds. But more than that, 
we need to place programs. Do we need two cardiac surgery programs in Baltimore, or should we spread those out across different regions of our uh, healthcare system? Once again, keeping in mind bringing care to the patient in a convenient fashion, but also not being wasteful and duplicative. And obviously, I'll mention resource management. The beauty of centralization in managing your supply chain, uh, your capital planning, your capacity goes without saying. My last slide that uh, I want to just mention when I'm thinking about redesign of healthcare for the future and where we're going, partnerships. Partnerships are the watchword, and I think they're going to drive greater impact on health than each of us trying to do it alone. Uh, and by partnerships, I mean public, private, healthcare partnerships, or any permutation of that. You can add your resources together to really tackle larger issues. And I'm gonna give you some examples. Certainly responding to the COVID-19 crisis, we were able to stand up a 250 bed field hospital in a matter of weeks by partnering Johns Hopkins Medicine, University of Maryland Medical System, and the state of Maryland. Three partners working together to increase capacity. We were also able to bring food to the community, increasing value for patients. I think we will see more partnerships with payers and partners, partnerships between hospitals and physicians to work together to drive down costs for our patients here in the US. So very novel payment models. Um, even program placement among competing health systems, dare I say it, but we have to really um, go beyond competition to think strategically about what's right for our patients. Do we merge our resources to create high quality programs in one location? And then finally, partnerships to address health inequity, health disparities. So here in the US, we have a lot of attention focused on the social determinants of health, housing, dental care, access to care, behavioral health. We have found that by partnering with other places, with other institutions and organizations, we can make a bigger impact. For instance, the Johns Hopkins Hospital and nine other hospitals in Baltimore City partnered with Healthcare for the Homeless and Baltimore City to provide 200 houses for our patients with homelessness. And it's not just houses, it is supportive wraparound services as well. Um, medical care, behavioral health care, job training, all of the above. So thank you all so much for hearing my thoughts today. You know, I would like to just sum up with uh, a little bit of, of what I've learned. Uh, I will tell you from living through this COVID-19 experience, it will be a lesson of a lifetime for me and fair to say my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins. I have learned personally that there are keys to our response that will serve us well going forward. Data, decisiveness, flexibility, transparency, communication. These are tenants we hold dear and that we will continue to launch in the future. But even more importantly, COVID has really accelerated emerging trends that will help redesign our healthcare for the future. And I hope I've left you with some of those thoughts uh, during the latter part of my talk. I'll end by saying, gosh, life is a succession of lessons which must be lived to be understood. I think back to event 201 that took place just a month before our current real life COVID-19. And I think back, gosh, what if we had had time to take the lessons learned from event 201 and apply them? Alas, we didn't, we've had to learn on the fly, but I am personally convinced that healthcare, not just here in the United States, but across the globe will be better for it. Thank you so much. Fine. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Actually, it's morning in your in your part of the world. Correct. Correct. So we're joined by a thousand seven hundred from.
healthcare workers in Asia. But we are really pleased for you to join us at 9.30 in your evening. But anyway, I only have a few minutes to ask you questions. Thanks very much for that presentation. But I oh, you're welcome. To ask, yeah, you did talk about Event 201, which is quite a revelation, I'm sure, for most of us that you simulated this pandemic in October, right? You had mentioned that. Yeah. And I just wanted to find out, like, is it possible to do a simulation when everything's, well, back to the new normal, there's really no back to the normal, right? But we're calmer and sort of back to an original state of mind. Is it possible to do a simulation today for the next pandemic Oh, I think it's not only possible, I think it's advisable. When I think about how much we have learned as an institution, as a state, as a country, and I'm sure you all share that opinion, um, it, it's so rich. We've actually kept copious notes uh, in the hopes. But if we were to do a simulation now, mm -hmm. taking all that we know, I think it would be an even more, more valuable exercise in helping us plan for the next pandemic. And there will be a next one. We know that, right? I think, yes. As you said, you can prepare for it, but there's nothing like just being on your toes when you're at it, yeah. which is how you learned in Johns Hopkins. The other question I wanted to ask was really about the redesign of healthcare. You talked about technology. You talked about precision medicine. So... What is it like for Johns Hopkins? Would you invest more in technology today rather than investing in expanding your hospitals or having more beds? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And I do say it with a grain of, of salt. The, the short answer is yes, I would highly recommend investing in technology, the digitalization of medicine. Absolutely. I say it with a grain of salt because we planned our new patient towers 20 years ago, and these towers yeah. opened in 2012. The watchword of the day was that hospitals would only be ICUs and ORs and nothing else, and that we should shrink our bed complement. Mm. Luckily, we didn't because you know, prior to COVID, we were at 95% occupancy. Now, I think part of that is indicative to medical centers where we have some highly specialized care, uh, we do tend to be. Having said that, uh, I, think, uh, I think administrators in the hospital field would be remiss not to think more broadly about digitalization. You know, we started off with electronic medical records, which we all embrace, and then digitized images and radiology, and now we're moving on to pathology my institution. But now that the challenge is to take all that data that we digitize and yeah. put it to good use. Predictive analytics and really being able to harness the power of that to improve mm -hmm. care. And I think we're doing it. Telemedicine is mm -hmm. an example. We have ramped up our telemedicine on steroids. Wearables, were, in my opinion, will take telemedicine to the next level. Right. Being able to monitor our patients without having to be online with them, to know in real time what the heart rate's doing, uh, what their pulse ox is doing, their EKG, perhaps even a sweat index. You can imagine harnessing that. And that's in the ambulatory world. I think about inpatient care. Does everyone need to be in a hospital? Are some, some things mainly just need monitoring? And can we really embrace hospital at home? If we have the right analytics, the right data, it should be able to see at home mm -hmm. whether that patient is deteriorating and needs transfer to the hospital quickly. We don't need a code team because we're able to predict before the right. patients even exhibit the symptoms. Right. So wearables, in my opinion, will lead the hospital at home. And then, of course, um, you know, I, I think all of these trends are just so valuable as we move forward that mm. any healthcare institution that does not do this is probably making a big mistake. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, if you have any questions, you can just type it in the chat box and we'll make sure to send it to you, Dr. Miller. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all. Have a great conference. Take care. Bye-bye.